Welcome to another edition of Return to the Word Radio with Bible teacher Mark Fontecchio. Advancing the message of God's amazing grace through the teaching of God's Word. And now with today's message, here is our teacher. Welcome back to another edition of Return to the Word. As you make your way to 1 Thessalonians 5, understand that the point that Paul wants believers to walk away with is that we are to have faith that we will be protected from the wrath of God and the tribulation. God's patience with mankind is running its course, and one day soon the nations of the world will face the wrath of the Lamb. But I believe that the intent of the Apostle Paul was to let the Christians at Thessalonica know that we should have faith, we should have confidence, that God will deliver us, God will protect the church, the bride of Christ, from the wrath that is to come by taking us to be with him at the rapture. We pick up our text, starting in verse 1, where we read, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Notice again the wording of verse 1. You have no need that I should write to you. He expected them to already know this teaching about the times and seasons. If you think back to our earlier studies, Paul and Silas had only been with the church at Thessalonica a very short time, and yet these believers in Christ had been fully instructed that no man can know the day or hour when our Savior will return. Think of the wording in both verses 1 and 2. You have no need that I should write to you about the times and the seasons, for you yourselves know perfectly about the day of the Lord. I want you to walk away with the understanding that these brand new Christians understood doctrines and topics from the Word of God that most Christians today do not understand. There needs to be a deeper hunger in the church of Jesus Christ for the teaching of the Word of God. These Christians at Thessalonica knew that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night because they knew the Hebrew Scriptures that are filled with references to the day of the Lord and they knew what Paul had taught them. Follow the flow of thought in 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 4 in our last study dealt with the rapture. Now we are referring to the tribulation. This period of time is known as Daniel's 70th week from Daniel 9. It is known as the time of Jacob's trouble from Jeremiah 30. Joel 2 warns, Blow the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand. Isaiah 2.12, Ezekiel 30, verse 3, Amos 5.18, Zechariah 14, 1-14, and Malachi 4.5, all warn about this time of judgment that is coming. In fact, the coming wrath of God is really the subject of the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, in 25, and it is the focus of much of the book of Revelation when God's wrath is unleashed upon this earth before the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The day of the Lord is a very important concept in the Word of God, so listen closely. In general, the broader concept is that it refers to a time when God intervenes in history to judge. There are times in the Old Testament when it was used to refer to prophecies that have historically already been fulfilled. Joel chapter 1 gives us a perfect example of this. But the day of the Lord can also refer to a time when God will intervene in the future to vindicate his people, destroy their enemies, and establish his kingdom. And this is how Paul uses the expression in our text. This is going to be a time of darkness, a time of despair and judgment upon the nation of Israel and the entire world that will come before the restoration of Israel and the establishment of the Messianic kingdom. Sometimes the day of the Lord in Scripture refers to a specific event. A good example would be in Zechariah 14, when Christ will set his feet on the Mount of Olives at his second coming. Other times, the Word of God uses this expression to refer to a period of time when God is judging. So in your study of the Word of God, when you come across this expression, the day of the Lord, you have to ask, is this an event or is this referring to a period of time when God is judging? 
context always determines meaning. And here we will see as we walk through our text that the context reveals that Paul has in mind a period of time. And specifically, he has in mind the seven years of the tribulation and God's judgment during that time. And as we are going to see, the church of Christ will be spared from this entire period of time. The teaching here is that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Now remember what we have seen. The day of the Lord will begin after the rapture of the church. It will come all of a sudden. It will come when the men and women of the world will not expect it. The thief comes at a moment in time that cannot be known ahead of time. And so it is with the day of the Lord. And since the rapture is next, and since the rapture kicks off the tribulation, it is going to take this world by surprise. Notice how this fits in verse 3. For when they say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. Notice that Paul isn't talking about the church. He clearly tells us they shall not escape. The lost, those without Christ. And if you skip down to verse 4 for just a second, there we see that Paul is addressing the church, isn't he? And there is a sharp contrast between the two verses, making it unbelievably clear that those who proclaim peace and safety are those who have not been transformed by the blood of the Lamb. Wrath and destruction is not for the bride of Christ. I hope you gain great comfort from the truth that Paul says at that time people will be proclaiming peace and safety because this has already become the catchphrase of our day like no other time in history. The men and women of the world want peace, but after the rapture of the church, the world will be in absolute shock and one man, the Antichrist, will step forward. He will have a message of peace. Daniel 9.27 reveals that the Antichrist will sign a peace treaty with Israel and he will establish a false sense of peace and safety in the world. And I really think this is what is being spoken about in verse 3. Right after the rapture, but before the tribulation starts, the people will want peace and safety. And the men and women of the world will be repeating this message of peace. And during the first part of the tribulation, after the peace treaty is signed, the people will think they have it. But the signing of the peace treaty between the Antichrist and the nation of Israel will be setting the stage for unprecedented destruction. Notice the wording. Sudden destruction comes upon them. Paul explains that when a woman is pregnant and in labor, it becomes obvious that very soon she will give birth. And in the same manner, those alive at that time during the tribulation who have come to faith in Christ after the rapture will be able to anticipate this period of persecution and destruction that God has revealed in Scripture. No one living on the earth will escape the destruction that will come. Just as a pregnant woman cannot escape the pain of labor, those alive in the tribulation cannot escape. God will break his silence. God will pour out his wrath upon the nations and the false confidence of men the false sense of security and peace will come to an end when sudden destruction comes upon them the destruction that will come upon those left behind will be the outpouring of God's wrath during the great tribulation the lost men and women of the world will not realize what is heading their way until it overwhelms them and God's wrath falls upon them This phrase at the end of verse 3, and they shall not escape. Thinking of these men and women living during the tribulation, this always brings to mind Revelation 6. Listen again to Revelation 6, speaking of this time during the tribulation. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Who's able to stand? Who's able to escape? The answer is no one. No one shall be able to escape the wrath of the Lamb. Notice how our text shifts starting in verse 4. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you, as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night 
nor of darkness. Now pay attention to the sharp contrast from verse 3. In verse 3, the subject matter was the loss of the world caught unprepared for the wrath of God. Paul starts verse 4 by saying, But you, brethren, notice this next statement, are not in darkness. Darkness was a common metaphor for sin, the things that are not of God. Darkness represents separation from God. It represents ignorance of the truth of God. This darkness, this ignorance has blinded the lost. It has blinded them from seeing the gospel of Christ and God's coming wrath upon the nations. Praise the Lord, Christians, that we are not in darkness. This is why Paul told the church in the second half of verse 4, this day would not overtake them as a thief. The lost live in darkness. The lost will be overtaken by God's wrath. But in Christ, we will not. The day in question in verse 4 ties us back to verse 2, the day of the Lord. Paul was letting the church know that the day of the Lord would not overtake them unexpectedly, like a thief would. The day of the Lord should not come as a surprise to the church of Christ. And why could Paul say this? Well, first, because in Christ, we have the discernment and wisdom of God that comes to us through the Holy Spirit. But secondly, think back. When does the day of the Lord begin? After the rapture of the church. We're going to be taken out of this world to be with Christ. So in verse 5, Paul explains to the church why the day of the Lord will not overtake us. And the first statement in verse 5 is that we are all sons of light and sons of the day. At this point, the day does not refer to the day of the Lord, does it? At this point, day is contrasting with night light with darkness. Sons of the light was an expression which meant that we as followers of Christ belong to the light, the light of Christ. But it also means because the word sons is used that the relationship we have is like the relationship a son would have with his parents, an intimate relationship, a close relationship. Paul told the church in Ephesians 5, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Because of our new birth in Christ, we have passed from the realm of darkness to the realm of light when we came to faith in Christ as our Savior. And this is why the coming wrath of the Lamb should not trouble us. Because of who we are in Christ Jesus and because of the glorious hope we have in Christ, the difference for us should be as clear as the difference between night and day. And this is why Paul writes, We are not of the night nor of darkness. Men who belong to the night are completely alienated from God. But that is not who we are in Christ. Until Christ returns, we are to live in a state of readiness, knowing that one day soon, Christ is going to return. And this is exactly where Paul takes us next. Take a look at verses 6 and 7. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. Now think of what Paul is teaching us with the statement, let us not sleep as others do. This is not the same wording that Paul used back in chapter 4 about those who had fallen asleep in Christ, those who had passed away. Different wording used because a different meaning is intended. The meaning here is another figure of speech, meaning those who do not watch, those who do not pay attention. In simple terms, we must not act like the lost. We must not become idle in our faith and fail to realize the importance of being on guard in our faith. But instead, Paul teaches us to watch and be sober. The idea of watching is being alert, living in light of our position in Christ, always looking for the return of the Lord. Listen, Christians who are not studying the end times and Christians who are not living in light of the return of Christ are ignoring the clear teaching of the Word of God. Think of how often the Word of God commands us to be waiting and watching for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.7, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Titus 2.13, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hebrews 9.28, to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. We are to be eagerly waiting for, living for the return of Christ for his church. Now, take a look at something in our text. At the end of verse 6, Paul says, be sober. 
In verse 7, he reminds the church, those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. And then in the first part of verse 8, Paul writes, but let us who are of the day be sober. Now think to yourself, what is Paul really driving at? Do you think his intent was simply to warn the Christians at Thessalonica about the dangers of being drunk? Or was it his intent to use this as a way to represent the darkness and ignorance that the lost were in? Now, drunkenness is surely condemned in the word of God. Paul condemns it in Romans 13. Not the use of alcohol, but drunkenness. Yet I don't think for a minute this was Paul's point here. Sleeping is something that we all do at night. And the argument is, it is natural to sleep at night. In Paul's day, just like today, people typically got drunk at night. Paul was not condoning it, but it was a simple fact that drunkenness was something that was mainly done at night. And so the idea being expressed in these verses is that certain activities take place in the night. Sleeping or the loss becoming drunk, either one makes a person ignorant of what is taking place around them. And along that same line of thinking is that for the lost man, the lost woman, because they belong to darkness, they are indifferent towards the things of God. But for the man or woman in Christ, we are not of the night. We are of the day. And in the daytime, there are certain behaviors that are normal. And being sober is an activity of the day. And Paul explains in the second part of verse 8 that being sober represents putting on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Now, this is one of Paul's favorite metaphors for Christian armor. This is important to understand. We stand on the threshold of the rapture of the church. It could happen at any time. And since the rapture is the next prophetic event that will take place, and because it could take place at any moment in time, believers must arm themselves for action. And the first piece of armor is the breastplate of faith and love. Now, this piece of armor is indispensable. The breastplate was a piece of armor that covered the soldier's body from neck to waist and protected his heart. Our first piece of armor is faith and love. Faith is the attitude of the believer towards Christ as his Redeemer and Lord. Love is the expression of the Christian life towards Christ and towards our brothers and sisters in the faith. Faith protects our relationship with God and love protects our relationship with others. Faith and love cannot be separated. If you are walking by faith, you will love other people. The Christian without love for others is the Christian that is not walking by faith. If you live your life by faith with love for the brethren and love for the lost, then you are standing ready for the rapture. The second piece of armor is the helmet, which is described as the hope of salvation. Listen closely. One of the biggest mistakes that Christians make when they study the Bible is that every time they see the word salvation, they automatically assume that the text is referring to our past redemption in Christ. The wording simply means to be delivered or saved from something. Sometimes it simply means physical rescue. And this is the idea in Matthew 8, 25, when the disciples woke Jesus because of the storm and said, Lord, save us. We are perishing. Salvation can also refer to our redemption, which is past tense or first tense salvation. Salvation can refer to our sanctification, which is present tense or second tense salvation. And salvation can refer to our future deliverance or glorification, also known as third tense salvation. Here, the context itself makes it pretty clear that the hope we have in Christ means that we can look forward to the future with confidence that we will be delivered from the wrath of God. In other words, the hope of salvation guards our thinking and helps us to have confidence of our future in Christ. The blessed hope that we have that Christ could return at any moment, this guards our thinking and helps us to have faith that we're going to be delivered from the wrath of God that will be poured out upon the earth. We're to have faith that we will be protected from the wrath of God and the tribulation. Take a look at how verses 9 and 10 flow right out of this. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. 
The purpose of God is not that his children will face his wrath, but eternal fellowship with the Son. Back in chapter 1, verse 10, Paul wrote, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. In both of these passages, the wrath of God is for the lost at the day of the Lord. God's purpose for us in Christ is salvation, not destruction. Christ did not die on the cross so that we can face his wrath. He died for our salvation, our deliverance. And it is not part of his plan that his church should face his wrath. Wrath is the destiny of those who reject Christ, not those who are redeemed by Christ. Believers shall look forward to the day when Christ returns for his bride and we can obtain the full measure of our salvation. Now back in our text, notice that our salvation comes through our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one who died for us. He's our redeemer and has taken our place on the cross, which is the reason we do not have to face the wrath of God. Jesus Christ died as our substitute. Jesus satisfied the wrath of God for us on the cross. And so there is no reason we would face it again during the day of the Lord. Notice the statement in the second half of verse 10, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Now, the big question here is, did Paul mean whether we are alive or dead like he did back in chapter four? Or did Paul mean whether we are spiritually alert or spiritually asleep at the time of the rapture? In chapter four, Paul used different wording when he was referring to Christians being dead or alive. Here, Paul uses the same exact wording that he did in verse 6 when he was clearly referring to Christians being alert and Christians being asleep. In other words, Christians saved by faith, but not truly alert in Christ. Paul's point here seems to be that all Christians belong to Christ. And if you're alert and watching at the time of the rapture, well, praise God. And if you're not being watchful, If you're living in a way that you'll be ashamed at his coming, you still will live together with Christ for all eternity. You'll be saved from God's wrath, whether you're being watchful or not. But living together with Christ is the highest description of our salvation and eternal life that we find in the word of God. This will be the very essence of our eternal life. And it is no wonder that Paul concluded this thought by telling the church, therefore comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. This is why the body of Christ is so important. And this is why you can never grow to be what God desires you to be apart from the body of Christ. Each believer is seen as a holy temple of God in the process of construction. We each are under construction and will be until we go to be with Christ. But right now, we need each other to continue to build up one another in our faith because each brother or sister in Christ has something that they can contribute to the work of the Lord. And whether we like it or not, we have a responsibility to the body of Christ. And part of our goal should be to leave our brothers and sisters in Christ stronger in the faith than they were before. The comfort and encouragement Paul had in mind is the comfort that comes when we are reminded of our glorious future with Christ. And Paul could report that the church at Thessalonica had been faithful to the task of building up one another in the Lord. After Nelson Mandela emerged from prison after being locked up for 27 years, he taught the world a lesson in grace. After he was elected president of South Africa, he appointed a panel called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Now, the rules were simple. If a white policeman or an army officer voluntarily faced his accusers, confessed his crime, and fully acknowledged his guilt, he could not be tried and punished for that crime. At one hearing, a policeman named Vandebrock described an incident when he and other officers shot an 18-year-old boy and burned the body. They actually turned it on the fire like a piece of meat at a barbecue in order to destroy the evidence. Eight years later, Vandebrock returned to the same house and seized the boy's father. The wife was forced to watch as policemen tied her husband onto a woodpile, poured gasoline over his body, and ignited it. The courtroom grew quiet 
as the elderly woman who had lost her son and her husband was given a chance to respond. And the judge asked her, what do you want from Mr. Vandebrock? Listen to what she asked for. She said she wanted Vandebrock to go to the place where they had burned her husband's body and gather up the dust so she could give him a decent burial. With his head looking down, the policeman nodded in agreement. And then she added one more request. She said, Mr. Vandebrook, he took all my family away from me, and I still have a lot of love to give. Twice a month, I would like for him to come to the ghetto and spend a day with me so I can be a mother to him. I would like Mr. Vandebrock to know that he can be forgiven by God and that I forgive him too. I would like to embrace him so that he can know my forgiveness is real. Some of the people in the courtroom burst out in a song singing Amazing Grace as the elderly woman made her way from the witness stand. But Vandebrock did not hear that hymn because he fainted, completely overwhelmed. Justice was not done in South Africa that day because something beyond justice took place and the name for it is Grace. Rather than seeking justice for sin, an old woman, absorbed the hurt, and offered forgiveness. I would suggest to you that this is precisely what the Lord Jesus has done for us. He has taken the hurt. He has taken the punishment that we deserve. And in its place, he offers forgiveness. Each and every one of us deserves justice. Each of us deserves the sentence of eternal death from the judge. But Christ offers us love and forgiveness. He offers us his amazing grace. And this is why the redeemed in Christ will not face the coming wrath of the Lamb. And this is why we must be known for the same type of love, grace, and forgiveness that Christ has demonstrated to us as we seek to edify one another in the faith, always looking forward to the return of our Lord. We'll see you next time, and I pray that you will continue to grow in your faith in the Savior, Jesus Christ. Return to the Word Ministries is committed to teaching the full counsel of God's Word and the gospel of Jesus Christ. For more about our ministry, please visit returntotheword.com. Return to the Word is a faith ministry. This means we freely distribute the teaching of the Word of God over the air and online. We do this without charge. If you feel led to support the ministry with a donation to help cover these costs, you may do so on our website, returntotheword.com, or by mailing a donation to Return to the Word, P.O. Box 879259, Wasilla, Alaska, 99687. Thanks for listening, and we pray that the Word of God will be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. Join us next time for another edition of Return to the Word.